like you to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse 6. Back in July, I began a new series that I entitled, Building a Better Future. And we were talking about striving for a better life. Catching a new vision, a new dream, a new goal for what can be. And what God wants us to be and what God wants to do in our lives. And the first week, we talked about we need a plan. If we're going to build a better future... If we have a goal or a dream, we need to have a plan. It's not just enough to identify the dream or to identify the goal. We need to come up with a plan, a plan of attack. What is it going to take? And we looked at seven biblical steps that go into planning. Pray and ask God's favor. Prepare for an opportunity and then wait. Expect fear, but don't let it stop me. Establish a clear target. We need to set a deadline. It can't just be open-ended someday. We need to anticipate the barriers that will come our way, that we'll face along the journey, and then we trust God to meet all our needs. The week after that, we looked at after we have a clear vision or a dream of what we feel God wants to do with our lives, how do we enlist the help of others in that dream? Who who can support the dream? And that week, we talked about nine different steps. We have to wait for the right timing to ask others. We have to make sure we've done our homework first. We need to protect the dream from premature death. Don't talk about it until you've done the homework and you're ready. We need to talk about we and not just me if you want others to help. We need to paint a picture of what needs to change so that they can see it. We need to appeal to people's hearts. We need to share our own story of how God put that burden on our heart or that dream in our mind so that it can inspire others to get on board. Then we ask confidently, not sheepishly, and then we have to ignore the naysayers and expect God's help. And then the last time I spoke, we talked about how to overcome opposition because along the way, we're going to have it. We, there are going to be people who want to derail us from building that better life. And we looked at we need to tell God about it, how upset we are. We need to confidently, in the face of that opposition, express our trust in God. We need to be better than those who insult us. We need to make God our defender by tithing. We talked about that. And then we need to remember, hey, I'll be rewarded forever. Well, today we're going to talk about the fact that our lives are not a 50-yard dash. The goal is not to get to the end as quickly as we can. Instead, life is a marathon. The goal is to pace ourselves and to do the right things so that we make it all the way to the finish line. And not just make it to the finish line, but make it to the finish line standing. If you've ever watched a marathon or maybe you've participated in one, you know that at the starting point, it's very, very crowded. There are a lot of people at the starting line. But as the marathon goes on, the crowd begins to thin out and the distance between the runners, the participants, gets wider and wider. There's more space. And along the way, many, many people drop out. They don't make it to the finish line. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want it to happen to me, but I don't want it to happen to you. I love you too much. As one of your pastors here, it's my job to make sure that that doesn't happen to you in the marathon of life and that you do make it to the finish line standing. I want you to finish well. I intend to finish well, and by God's grace, I am going to finish the race that he has called me to. Now, If we're actually going to make it all the way to the finish line, and we're going to build some character qualities in our lives along the way, we need to build some Christ-like qualities if we're going to make it, if we're going to wind up standing at the end. We need to build in our lives endurance and resilience and balance and pacing. We're going to have to learn these skills. And again, a lot of people start off great in life, but even before they get to the halfway point, they've already messed it up, And they've given up, which is actually worse than messing up. Giving up is always worse than messing up. Everybody messes up. 
Why do people give up in the marathon of life? Well, the main reason usually is because they got discouraged. Discouragement is a deadly disease. Discouragement will zap our energy. It will blur our focus. It will distort our reality. We don't see things clearly when we're discouraged. We don't see things as they really are. And that often kills our motivation. The other problem with discouragement is that it's also highly contagious. If we get around a group of discouraged people, we'll soon get discouraged. We get around a bunch of negative people and we're listening to those discouraging voices all the time, or we're watching and listening to those discouraging voices in the media all the time, you're going to get discouraged. And you're, you're, you're going to get discouraged about the future. And instead of building a better future, you're going to just be resigned to the future. I'll tell you what's really sad is that a lot of people, they shrivel up and they die inside before they die. They never experienced what it feels like to really be alive and connected to God. And they don't reach their God-given dream. That's why today I want to show you what God says in His Word in the book of Nehemiah about what to do when we feel like giving up. And I hope you don't feel that, that way right now. You might. I don't, I don't know what everybody's going through in their personal life here today. You might be in the middle of something very discouraging. I hope you're not. But I do know this, one day you're probably going to need this message, the things we talk about. So we've come to the second part of chapter 14. And in this second part of chapter 14, we're going to look at four of the most common causes or reasons why people get discouraged, why we get discouraged in life. And then it also gives us the cure, God's steps for getting out of discouragement. And before we get into that text, though, let me just say, uh, let me give a little background, a little history of the story of Nehemiah for maybe somebody who this is the first time that they're here or tuning in to this series. Um, it starts in 586 B.C. The nation of Israel is conquered by the Babylonian Empire. That's present-day Iraq. And most of the people in Israel were taken captive, and, and, the, and they were... Prisoners of war taken out of the country. For 70 years, they were held captive. Finally, when the Persians, and that's modern-day Iran, conquered the Babylonians, the Persian king, King Cyrus, he said, well, yeah, the Jews, they can go back to their homeland. When they get to their homeland, though, in Israel, when they get to Jerusalem, what they found was everything was destroyed. Their homes, the city, the temple... The protective walls that were around Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar had leveled it all. Everything. And they're living. They get back there. They go back home. They want to get back to their nation. Their land. But they're living in ruin and rubble. In a destroyed city. And well in this book Nehemiah. It's written really to discouraged people. They were very discouraged. But then God came along and he put a dream in the heart and the mind of a man named Nehemiah. And he said, Nehemiah, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and I want you to rebuild the wall around the city for the protection of all its enemy uh, residents against its enemies. So they go back and they're rebuilding and they start building a better future. I want you to pick up with verse 6 in Nehemiah chapter 4. So we built the wall and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the wall of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. Nehemiah says, and we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And the enemy said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them 
and stop that work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us, Ten times you must return to us. You've got to leave building the wall and come back home. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share this message. I pray that you will use it in each of our hearts and lives to be that encouragement, that motivation, that example before us so that when we come across the difficult uh, parts of the journey in, in, in our quest for reaching the dream, the goal, the life that you have called each one of us to, we don't give up. But instead, Lord, we know how to conquer the the despair and the hardships that come our way and we can prevail and we can endure and we can end our marathon of life standing strong in you. And so I pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Today in this story, we get to the point where they had built the wall all the way around, but they had only got it up to half its height. They were halfway there. In fact, the Bible told us that they very quickly rebuilt the first half of that wall around Jerusalem. But at the halfway point, they got discouraged. The initial enthusiasm wears off. The people start feeling tired, and for a variety of reasons, they just want to give up. This is typical. Discouragement always strikes at the midway point of anything we are doing. We have enthusiasm at the start when we're getting ready to start something. We're full of enthusiasm and, and, and you know, op, uh, optimism and all of that energy. And we usually have enthusiasm at the end when we can see the finish line. We have great enthusiasm in the beginning and at the end. But the discouragement pops up in the middle. That's true in life and it's true in our careers. I imagine for the students that are here today and the teachers about midway through it after the first semester and you're halfway through the school year it perhaps gets to be a little bit discouraging. I know it's true in parenting about the time your child gets to be those teenage years those can be very trying very difficult it gets a little bit discouraging. It's true in marriage. I mean the honeymoon is great. The golden years are amazing but it's in between where most of the divorces take place. I've got a lot of enthusiasm the first day of a diet. There is no more false hope than the first day of a diet. And we feel pretty good when we, when we get towards the end. I'm only five pounds away. At least I, I've always imagined that it would feel pretty good. I've never really gotten that close myself. But it's in the middle part we get discouraged. If you're in the middle of anything right now, it would not surprise me if you feel like giving up. They don't call it the midlife crisis for nothing. It's not the middle, or it's not the beginning, it's not the end, it's the middle. So let's look at four things that typically discourage us. Here's number one, fatigue. The number one cause of discouragement is emotional or physical exhaustion. We simply run out of energy. Notice verse 10 again. Then the people of Judah began to complain that the workers were becoming tired. We don't think straight when we're tired, when we haven't slept, when we're worn out, when we're weary, when we're wasted. Rebuilding anything is exhausting. Rebuilding is always harder than the initial building, actually. And these walls, uh, wall builders had worked hard on the first half of the project, but now they're exhausted. I love how the message translation says this. But soon word was going around in Jerusalem, the builders were pooped. Every one of us can relate to that. Sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is just get in bed and go to sleep. Studies tell us that Americans are the most sleep-deprived people on the planet. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's probably true for much of the developed world. Vince Lombardi famously said, Fatigue makes cowards of us all. Have you ever noticed how much better things look after you've had a good night's sleep? I mean, problems just don't seem as bad when we've had some sleep. Look at this next verse. 
Never forget how the Amalekites attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who began to lag behind. There's a spiritual principle here. We get attacked when we're exhausted and weary. We get struck down when we start lagging behind. Expect attacks any time we're exhausted. I'm just giving you some fatherly, brotherly advice. That's what happened here in this story in Nehemiah. The people got worn out. In your life, it may be an attack of temptation. Expect that when you're tired, when you're drained. The more vulnerable uh, we are to temptation when we're tired. It may be an attack of anger. You know, we get more irritable when we get tired. It may be a, an attack of self-pity. We just need to be aware, guard against it, that fatigue makes us vulnerable to discouragement. Here's number two. Frustration. Frustration is the second major cause of discouragement. When we can't seem to get ahead, we're always behind and we can never catch up. When the project that we're working on is more complex than we thought it was going to be. When the stakes are longer and higher than we expected. And when we have problems that we can't seem to solve. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah, every one of us can identify with those things. And well, when we get that kind of frustration in our lives, we're going to be a sucker for discouragement. Have you ever tried to maybe clean out a closet or a garage or a spare room or even maybe the obsolete files out of your file cabinet in your office? And, and, you, and you pull them all out and you lay everything in the middle of the floor and there are so many decisions to make that you just get discouraged. You just throw it all back in the closet and you say, this is just too much. We get so frustrated just trying to decide, do I keep it or do I toss it? Years ago, I was remodeling every room of a home that we had bought. We turned our attached garage into a 20 by 20 game room. I uh, put raised panel, raised paneling all around it, halfway up the wall. Uh, the kid, every room I painted, I put crown molding throughout the house, new carpet, new flooring, things I didn't know how to do. Rick did for me, he did them. The entire house was in disarray for like a year, maybe a little bit longer. And it was very frustrating to all of us, all of us that lived there. And not just because of the time. But it was really frustrating because of all the rubble and the clutter. Boards and sawdust and drywall dust without end. Never, never, you know, just always there, always back. The smell of paint and of, you know, stain in the air. Furniture was constantly being shifted around depending on what room I was working in. The fact is, any time we rebuild something, we're going to have debris. It's just a fact. There's going to be rubble. There's, there's going to be rubbish and trash. And debris in our lives causes discouragement. Look at verse 10 again. And there was so much rubble to be removed. They were all discouraged by the piles of broken stuff lying all around them. What's the rubble in your life? Rubble is the broken stuff I keep tripping over. And there's physical rubble, bricks, trash, things that are broken. But there's also emotional rubble. There's relational rubble. There's financial rubble. There's bad, the rubble you get from bad decisions. Rubble will always be a part of our lives. Why? Because we live in a world where everything on the planet is broken and we can't avoid the rubble. And if we get too much rubble in our lives, we get frustrated. Unmanaged rubble wastes our time. Unmanaged rubble zaps our energy. Unmanaged rubble keeps us from moving forward. Unmanaged rubble in our lives causes conflict. And unmanaged rubble not only frustrates us, it frustrates everybody else too. For the Israelites, besides the tripping, there was so much rubble and trash to be removed. They're going, we're never going to get this place cleaned up. We're never going to get organized. What they don't realize is this. The stuff in our lives that we trip over, the rubble in our lives, 
is often the same stuff that God is going to use to build or rebuild our lives with. The, The Israelites were literally taking those broken pieces of the wall and putting them back together and rebuilding that wall. All the king's horses and all the king's men, the nursery rhyme says, couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again, but God can. The true king can, and he will, if we'll cooperate with him and if we'll allow him. Let me give you three rules of rebel removal in our lives. Here's A. I must continually clean it out of my life. I must be continually vigilant. Vigilant to clean out all the broken stuff in my life that keeps tripping me up. It's a never-ending task. And we'll never clear out all the rubble in our lives until we get to heaven. But it's one of the things that God wants us to work on. If I'm not cleaning out the broken things in my life, I'm going to trip over them, and I'm not going to make it to the finish line. The second rule of rubble removal is B. If I don't deal with it, it will take over my life. Our weaknesses are not just our weaknesses. They're the things that keep us from God's purpose in our lives if we let them. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I've discovered that trash multiplies when we're not watching it. Have you noticed that? It's like, where where did that pile of stuff come from? We didn't even notice. Trash multiplies when we're not looking. What is rubble? Rubble is a sign of that we're neglecting something. When the dishes pile up, or the laundry piles up, or anything piles up, magazines pile up, it means we're neglecting something. I have to continue to clean out my life, and if I don't deal with it, it'll take over my life. Here's the third rule. I can't always see the rubble that's in my life, but others do. I've become apathetic to it. I'm used to tripping over it. It's not even a thing anymore. I don't see it, but everybody else can. It's a lot like our nose. Did you know that we always see our nose? Just close one eye and it'll become very obvious. We always see our nose, but our mind just filters it out. I don't see it, but everybody else can, the rubble in my life. That's why we need each other. I have rubble in my life that I don't even know is rubble. But actually, it's as plain to see as the nose on my face. Which means I need to be humble about the broken places in my life. And so do you. But frustration makes us discouraged. Here's a verse we need to pray when we're frustrated by the rubble in our life. Come, Lord, and show me your mercy, for I am helpless, overwhelmed in deep distress. Here's the third common cause for discouragement. Feeling like I am failing. What does it mean when I feel like I'm failing? And well, it's the sensation that I've bitten off more than I could chew. That this project I'm undertaking is going to take me down. We throw up our hands and we say, you know, I I can't take this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Well, that's the feeling of failing. And can I tell you something? Honestly, I feel like that just about every Monday morning. I think, man, you know, the church really isn't growing. My illustrations are unrelatable. That message yesterday stunk. But at the halfway point, when they're building and they're tired and there's rubble, then the third thing it says is this. By ourselves, this is, this is the workers, by ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. What are they doing? They're feeling like failures. They're feeling incompetent. They're feeling defeated. And there's probably even a little bit of shame mixed in there. We should have never started this project. We're, there's so much junk everywhere. It's just too crowded. It's just, it's just too complex. We'll never be able to finish it. The person who says I can and the person who says I can't, they're both right. Because if you say I can't do it, well, guess what? You can't. They lost their confidence and they doubted their competence. They said, who were we to think we could do this project? Who who were we to even attempt this dream? 
That's probably going to happen to you at some point in your life. You've got a great de- dream, and at some point, the devil whispers in your ear, who do you think you are attempting this? I get it. But that's the wrong question. We build our lives and our dreams not on what we think we can do, but what we think God can do. We let the size of our God determine the size of our dreams. Do you, do you think I would have tried all the things I've tried in ministry over the years if I thought it all depended on me? Uh, not a chance. In my flesh dwells no good thing. I know that I can't do certain things. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's pretty clear. Now, how do we react when our plans take longer than expected? When they're more complicated than anticipated? Give in to self-pity? Start complaining? Start blaming other people? No. If at first we don't succeed, we're normal. Nobody succeeds at first. The only way we actually succeed in life is by failing a bunch and learning what doesn't work. Failure is a stepping stone to success. Nobody succeeds without failures. I don't care if your name is Steve Jobs, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, or anybody else. The difference between successful and unsuccessful people is this. Successful people see failure as a temporary setback. Unsuccessful people see it as a mark on their character. Well, I'm just a failure. No. Nobody succeeds in everything. Nobody has a record of an unbroken record of success. The feeling of failure will cause us discouragement. Here's the fourth common discouragement cause. Number four is fear. The last time we talked, the Jews were facing insults and criticism and ridicule. Now we see the enemies have moved well beyond that to threatening. They're actually threatening bodily violence. The Bible says in verse 11, And our enemies said, They will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop this wretched work. We're going to be stealth. We're going to slip in behind you while you're working on the wall and we're going to stab you in the back. Now that's That's a pretty legitimate reason to be discouraged. You might die if you keep working on this project. However, the the enemies didn't actually have to go through with the threat because they did scare them and the fear worked. They stopped working for a while. Fear always discourages us. And I want you to notice who got discouraged at first. The Jews who were their neighbors kept reporting kept gossiping the bad news. The Jews who were their neighbors kept reporting, they have us surrounded, they're going to attack. If we heard it once, we heard it ten times. But the people who got discouraged first were the folks who lived closest to the enemies, the Jews who were their neighbors. They were the source of the fear. The point is, if we hang out with negative people and we're constantly listening to them, like the negative media, We're going to become a fearful person. Some of you, maybe the best thing you can do is turn off the television. It's making you a fearful person, a frightened person, a negative person, a scared person. There's a lot of good in the world, but we don't see it if all we're getting is negative, negative. I wonder what secret fear is maybe discouraging you right now. Well, how do we defeat these common enemies that create discouragement in our lives? We do what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah did four things. Here's number one. I rest my body. Maybe the first thing we need to do is simply get more sleep than what we're currently getting. Psalm 119 says this. You made my body, Lord. Now give me a sense to heed your laws. Regular rest is so important that God put it in the, in the Ten Commandments. It's right up there with, don't value anything above God. Don't murder anybody. Don't lie and defraud people. Don't commit adultery. It says every six days, you should take a day off. It's called the Sabbath. That's how important rest is. Our best deserves rest. 
And we can't be the man or the woman that God wants us to be if we're always burning the candle at both ends. And we're not getting our proper rest. Look at this next verse. It's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. In building a better life, in reaching the goal, acquiring the dream that God has put on your heart, God does not want you to become a workaholic. He doesn't want you anxiously working from early morning to late at night, always stressed, always worried. God wants you to get your proper rest. Listen, if you're always on the go, trying to achieve that dream, trying to make that first million and Serving God is not a priority in your life. You had to put that, the time it would take, the energy, the effort, the wherewithal to serve God, you had to put that on the altar of sacrifice. And and you have to escape several weekends a year sacrificing the worship of God, doing exactly what His Word says not to do, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. If you have to do all of that just to deal with the hectic pressure and stress of life that you've put yourself in, then let me tell you something. Number one, your goal, your dream is not from God. What I just described, all of it, flies directly in the face of what His Word teaches us. And two, you haven't learned anything from the Apostle Paul who said this. I've learned to be satisfied with the things I have and with everything that happens. I know how to live when I'm poor, and I know how to live when I have plenty. I've learned the secret of being happy at any time, in everything that happens, when I have enough to eat and when I go hungry, when I have more than I need and when I do not have enough. I can do all things through Christ because He gives me strength. Let me tell you, satisfaction and success and fulfillment have nothing to do with how much. It's all about The what. What are you living for? Better is not synonymous. It's not a synonym for more. That's a lie perpetrated by the father of lies. Hollywood, Park Avenue, the suburbs outside of Washington, D.C., where all the wealth is concentrated, are filled with people living the most dysfunctional of lives. If living a balanced, God-centered, God-focused life brings you great wealth, that is fantastic, that's wonderful. But here's the truth. In America, we might all, as citizens, have an equal opportunity to achieve that. But that doesn't mean that that is God's dream for your life. In most cases, we'll be trading God's dream for a lesser dream. We'll maybe have a jam-packed life, but we'll miss Christ's abundant life. I guarantee it. You'll be burdened, you'll be worried, you'll be stressed, you'll be discouraged. There's a story in the book of 1 Kings chapter 19 about a guy named Elijah. He's a prophet. And he had just won a big God contest against pagan leaders and atheists and idolaters. But in the process, he expended all of his emotional energy. And he soon hears that the queen is angry at him because the guys he just defeated and put to shame were hers. And so he goes and he runs and he hides in a cave. He is so down, he's depressed, he's discouraged. He's the classic example of burnout. In fact, he's so discouraged that he asked God to kill him. I just want to go to heaven. Lord, just take me now. Let me just end this life. I'm done with it. And well, God answers his discouragement with this. God feeds him and then tells him to go to sleep. Then God wakes Elijah up and he feeds him some more and he tells him to go back to sleep. Eat and sleep, eat and sleep, eat and sleep. That might be a good model for some of you because again, sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is just go to bed, get some rest, rest my body, slow down how we'll beat discouragement here's number two i need to reinforce my weak areas what does that mean means i honestly assess where in my life i'm most vulnerable discover where the rubble is in my life 
What is the weakness in my life? What are the low points that seemingly always get washed out? Where am I most vulnerable to anger? Where am I most vulnerable to pride and to lust and to compulsion? We need to be mindful of what the devil uses to work on us. What's your fundamental sin? What's your fundamental temptation? We need to reinforce the weak areas. The Bible says this in Nehemiah 4.13. So I stationed armed guards at the most vulnerable points of the wall and at the most exposed places. I assigned people by families to protect each other with their swords, spears, and bows. Notice what he does. He checks things out. He does an assessment. How else would he know where the vulnerable sparts, uh, parts were and where the vulnerable spots were? He's been there. He's done his homework. He knows where the city is vulnerable. The exposed parts. He knows where they're at. Do you know what's most exposed in your life? Or Satan can just ram you and he wins every time because it's an exposed area? He or his minions, they get to you and he goes, got her again. Got him again. And he wins every time. Do you know where you're most vulnerable? This is the thing. We've got to reinforce our weak areas. But before we can reinforce them, we've got to know where they are. And notice that Nehemiah doesn't give up on the goal. When everybody else is discouraged and they've stopped working and they're wringing their hands and they're in panic, he doesn't say, you guys are right. We should have never tried this. Let's just, all of us, let's just go home and eat a TV dinner and watch The Tonight Show. No, he goes to work. He says, we're just going to have to do it differently. We're just going to have to reorganize. We're just going to have to reorder. We're going to have to new, have a new strategy. We're not giving up on the goal. Discouragement doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing the wrong thing. But it may mean we're doing it the wrong way. The Israelites were doing the right thing, building that wall. They were just doing it the wrong way. Many of you probably remember Gayla Bell. She had a dream for a bakery. And for years, she worked harder than anyone I've ever known. And every year, harder and harder. She wore herself out trying to make it work. And after nine years and surviving the 2020-2021 COVID business season, it looked like her dream was coming to a dreadful end. It was over. She got it wrong. But no. She just needed to pursue it differently. She still works hard, but she reorganized her business model, and it's working. The dream is still alive, maybe more alive than ever. She still works hard, but she also takes vacations now. Reinforce your weak areas. Keep growing and, and reorder where you need to reorganize. Are you deep in debt? Reorganize your budget. Are you out of shape? Reorganize and reorder your lifestyle and your eating patterns. Are you overstressed? Reorganize your time. You may need to eliminate some things out of your life. You may need to clean out the rubble, the clutter, the trivial time wasters, and simplify. And one more thing before I move on. Let's look at that passage I referenced earlier. Some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting together with other believers. But we must not do that. Instead, we should keep on encouraging each other. This is very important. Nehemiah said, I posted them by families. If we're going to make it to the finish line in the marathon of life, reach our goals, build a better future, the easiest thing in the world for Satan to do is to discourage a lone ranger Christian. We need other people in our lives. We're not going to make it otherwise. Satan is too smart. It's easy to pick off a single person. If you're not in a life group this semester like Jonah talked about, jump in. It's, it's not too late. And if you're not going to do that, then let me encourage you to at least start reorganizing your life so that in February you can get in the spring semester. Here's the third thing Nehemiah did. Number three, we need to refocus on God. 
I love what Nehemiah says in verse 14 because he knows that one of the problems, one of the causes of discouragement is fear. Aware of their anxiety, I stood up and I said to the noble offic- the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and awe-inspiring. What is Nehemiah doing here? He's saying, get your mind, on what, get your mind off of whatever is discouraging you and remember who God is, what God is like. Refocus on God. You say, well, what am I supposed to remember about the Lord in my circumstance? Well, we can remember his faithfulness, how he's always helped us through everything before. We can remember his goodness. We can remember his power. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful and all-knowing. We can remember that he is with us right now. We can remember that he sees everything that goes on in our lives, and he cares. We can remember his promises to us. Change the channel in our mind. When we're discouraged, the bottom line is we're thinking discouraging thoughts. That's our choice. We're as happy as we want to be, and we're also as discouraged as we want to be. We're we're discouraged because we're choosing discouraging thoughts. That's called stinking thinking. Don't replay all of those discouraging images in your mind. Choose to think about God, His faithfulness, His love, His mercy, His compassion. Switch the channel. One of my favorite book uh, verses in the book of Jonah is this. When I had lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord, and my earnest prayer went to you and your holy temple. That's what David did when he was discouraged. I'm completely discouraged, so revive me with your word. When we're discouraged, we need to stop listening to other people and spend more time listening to God. God will always tell us the truth. People won't. So, I rest my body, I reinforce my weak areas, I refocus on God, and here's the last thing. Number four, I need to resist discouragement. Don't give in without a fight. Fight back. Fight against the discouragement. Fight against the devil. Fight back against those who discourage you. In the second part of verse 14, we read this. Fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. We will never defeat discouragement by being passive. And I don't have time today to say a whole lot about this, but as believers, and most of you understand this, we're engaged in a spiritual battle. And where is that battle fought? It's not fought out here in the air. It's fought in our mind. And Satan's two favorite weapons in the battle for our mind are discouragement and distraction. Those are the two biggest things that he will use to get us off course. D.L. Moody once said, I have never known God to use a discouraged person. When we get discouraged, we get set on the shelf. Satan loves to fill our minds with discouraging thoughts. And well, I'm giving you permission today. To not believe those discouraging thoughts. This is the difference between ordinary people and great people. Great people never give up. They keep on in the marathon of life, in building a better future, in reaching the dream, even when they're fatigued, even when they're frustrated, and even when they feel like failures, even when they're fearful. As most of you know, Brian and I, we have something in common. Our favorite vacation is to go on a cruise. Kim and I, we will save like a miser for two years to do this. But what I really enjoy is sitting on a beach. And I've learned a very important principle in life doing that. Waves go out, but they always come back in. The tide goes out, but it always goes back in. And when the tide is out, and I'm not just talking about the waves, but I'm saying when the tide goes out, you know what happens? The beach is very ugly, and it reveals all kinds of debris and rubble and driftwood and seaweed and trash. When the tide is out, the beach doesn't look very good, but it always comes back in. Right now, the tide may be out in your life. Don't you dare give up. 
Hold on. The problems aren't going to last. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your church. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up. You might need to change the way you're doing something. You're doing the right thing, but you're just doing it the wrong way. Don't give up. Psalm 142 says this. When I'm ready to give up, he knows what I should do. Don't give up. Look up. Look up to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created you, who thought you up, who loves you, whose purpose for your life is great, who died on the cross for you, who rose again and is coming back one day and is going to take you to heaven. Look up to him. Jesus Christ is the source of our strength through the blessed Holy Spirit in our lives. Don't give up. Look up. As our musicians come forward, would you stand with me this morning? As you're standing, I want you to notice one last verse. God gives power to those who are tired and worn out, and he offers strength to the weak. Those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. This week, school, I mean, school's back in session. I've got some homework for you. Rest your body. Recognize what the vulnerable parts are in your life, the exposed areas, and start working to reinforce them. Stop listening to all the negativity and resist the discouragement. Don't you dare give in to it. It's a choice. If, if we're discouraged, it's because we're allowing ourselves to be discouraged. And we can't overcome it with passivity. We have to fight it. And as the last part of your homework, focus on God more. Focus on Him. Get in His Word a little bit more. He'll give you the energy to fight it. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we all know that there are areas in our lives where we're tired and where we're frustrated, where we even feel like failures. And God, as I come to you right now in prayer, I'm giving you my fatigue. God, I give you my frustrations. I give you the rubble in my life, the broken things that I keep tripping over. I don't want to live that way anymore. I give you the areas where I feel like a failure. I feel like I can't do it anymore. God, I give you all my fears. Lord, I don't want to be one of those people who lives closest to the enemy and just spreads the bad news to everybody else. I want to gossip the gospel. Not the negativity that's all around us. I want to be a bearer of good news. And so, Father, this week I'm asking you to help me. Give me the sense to heed your laws with greater diligence, devotion, determination. Help me to rest my body. Help me to reinforce my weak areas. Help me to, when I begin to think about things that, that bring me down, help me to change that channel in my mind and to just, just refocus on you. To not be afraid of the enemies, but to remember you, Lord, who is great and who is inspiring. And like David, Lord, I'm, I'm coming before you and I'm asking you to rewire me. Revive me with your word. Lord, help me resist discouragement. Help me to fight for what I know you want to do in and through my life. Dear Jesus, I'm praying that by the power of the Holy Spirit in me. I'm asking you to give me the strength when I'm weak and when I'm tired and when I'm worn out. And I guess, Lord, in a sense, though, I guess I actually want to thank you for the seasons of discouragement that do come into my life because it forces me to come to you. Discouragement can be good if I let it draw me to you and it causes me to trust you. praying with me today and if you've if you've never said Jesus Christ I'm yours say that to him right now Jesus Christ I'm yours and 
I'm all in. It's in your name we pray. Amen.